Welcome to part two of the Six of One story. This covers the early years from 1977 through to 1980. To say interest in the prisoner was huge would be an understatement. For two individuals, it was a voluntary full-time job in those early days. And as you'll hear, it was one hell of a roller coaster for us all. There were friendships forged, many exciting events ahead, and the prisoner bursting into the limelight, truly a movement that captured public imagination was born. But one thing I forgot, I hope you'll forgive me, a combination of a senior moment, and also there was so much else going on because it really, it took over our lives. But a really important and significant event was that in 1979, at very short notice, Roger Goodman flew over to Ireland where Patrick McGowan was making a film called The Hard Way. And there he got a very revealing and a very exhaustive interview, interview with Patrick. And that of course was in alert in those early days. So there was much happening and much to enjoy. We hope you do. Thank you very much indeed. Fasten your seatbelts and enjoy the ride. Okay, so we sent out that holding letter and on the 29th of, uh, let's have a look, where are we? Oh yes, there we are. This is the cutting from the echo. And Dave's held captive by the prisoner. And so it talks about all of this. Dave emphasized the Prisoner Appreciation Society is not intended as a fan club for Patrick McGowan. And he actually takes it quite seriously. Um, he also talks about a couple who said that uh, on the evening of December the 11th, they were at a party in London, left early, and drove and sat on the freezing cold Chilterns at this time of night to get the Midlands transmitter so that they could receive the prisoner on the portable TV. TV. <laughs> um, what we did was we sent out a holding letter to what we considered was the 40 most enthusiastic people that wrote in saying, look, look, why don't we all have a meeting and all present our ideas and you know then we can see where we go we can tell you where we are we can hear what your views are so on the 23rd of january some 40 of us all got together and there were a lot of discussion people seemed to want badges one chap said to me he said um you know, he said, I don't know how this is going to work. You've got some people that want badges. You've got others that want to discuss the deep philosophy. I don't know how you're going to please everybody. Anyway, we did manage to do that. Um, and the name Six of One was agreed. Other, other people thought of the Green Dome Society and various things like that. So having agreed the name and then everybody said, yes, you're the three best people appointed to, to run it. That is what we did. Um, on the same day, a national paper, the Sunday Mirror, had picked up, there we are, the story. And amongst other things, it says, it says, a cult of TV prisoners. A cult has grown up around a TV series, blah, 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 blah. Thousands of fans are following this futuristic series. Company director Keith Gould was so determined to not to miss the final episode that he took a portable TV to a party 15 minutes before it was due to show. This is the family that went up into the Chilterns. <laughs> In Canada, Toronto University Professor Stuart Neymar has developed part of his teaching schedule around the show. He considers it 
a work of genuine art and insisted on spending his honeymoon in Port Merion. And it goes on, quote from McGowan says, I always said it would be best rerun in 1984. Well, things were hotting up because I have a press release here from Granada Television. I always thought, thank goodness, that it was shown regionally and that it was shown in the Midlands region first because it then went round to the other regions who had been kind of, the fire had been lit and so they picked up on this. And uh, this is what is said by Mrs. Joan Riley of Granada TV in the publicity de department. Dear Mr. Barry, thank you very much for your letter, which I have taken so long in answering. The reason for the delay is I've been trying to contact various people to get publicity for you. Uh, and was waiting to see if I've got results. This very morning, the Daily Mail rang the office to say they were contacting you to get more information. And no doubt you will get more publicity from them. I'm enclosing a copy of a press release which we sent out to all papers, part of which quotes me as saying, the aims of the society are trying to expand the audience which watches the series, to examine the philosophy behind it and possibly organize a convention. The prisoner operates very cleverly on many levels. I feel one of our aims should be to enable people to understand the deeper meanings of the program. Well, things really started to hot up, didn't they? The most interesting thing is that TV was taken as being ephemeral and, you know, it was wallpaper, moving wallpaper. And suddenly, here was this programme, and not only were we seeing it seriously, but there were people, I remember Sean Usher, who was the... Um, uh, TV critic in one paper and Clive James in another. They were very, very keen on it as well. So we began to be taken in a serious way. So we go to February the 6th. Okay. And I have here what we call the Tally Ho Special Edition. By now, we are all kind of in gear, thanks to Roger and Judy. What I used to do was go to work and then on the way home, I'd call in. I might take my meal with me. I, I might go home and have a meal and then, then go. But I can remember, you know, they were just working on it full time. And I'd often pass Roger's window at half past 11 at night. And I could see him still working on the typewriter. Anyway, anyway so what did we say? We've written to Patrick McGowan. The name six of one's been decided on. We're going to have a constitution founded for the celebration and perpetuation of the prisoner on all levels. Non-political, non-religious, non-profit making, a society of individuals, etc., etc. Um, and also, we are meeting with an executive of the company that owns the prisoner. Now, after sending that out, we did. We met with ITC. I rang up ITC and I said, oh, excuse me, um, about the prisoner. Well, after a couple of minutes, it was evident that they thought I was a nutter, another nutter. I said, no, no, no. We are in the national papers. We have hundreds of people written to us. I'll ring you back. A couple of minutes later, someone rang back, a different person. What's happening? Tell me about this. Yes, yeah, okay, yes. Can you come down for a meeting? Yes, yes, we can. So we fixed a meeting. We went down to London, Lou Grade's company. We saw a chap called David, Mither David Withers, his right-hand man, who probed us. And when David Withers said to me, so how many members do you think you're going to have? I plucked a figure out of the air, 3,000. Ironically, within six months, we did have 3,000 members. 
At that point, David Withers turned to this other chap, Don Mead, who was in charge of all the ITC archive and said, Don, give them what they want. We got access to booklets all about the prisoner, which I assume had been done for the media. Story information booklets. This here, for you old enough to remember, is the way computers used to digest information, tape put in with all these holes back in those, those days. We got access, we got photographs, huge 10 by 8 photos use, use of, all sorts. We began to forge a very firm bond with um, them. Then we had the icing on the cake. And that was that ATV had tried to contact Patrick McGowan and got nowhere. It was Roger's suggestion that the three of us wrote a personal letter to McGowan sealed it in an envelope and it would be sent to McGowan's agent. This we did. So we don't know what the other two wrote. Ten days after sending it, we got the following cablegram from Patrick McGowan. I'll read it out to you. Addressed to the th three of us. Profoundly Profoundly grateful to you and the society for your interest and understanding. Stop. And most honoured to accept honorary presidency. Stop. He then gives his home address. Blessings to you all. Half a dozen of the other. Be seeing you. Well, that truly was the icing on the cake. And... Um, all armed with that, things began to really move forward. There was so much enthusiasm, and it was really like we'd met like minds, you know? Um, we got local groups. This is, this, is, this is one. We got about 30 local groups that all coalesced around the country. Age range from nine to 80 odd, you know? Um, we felt like it was a growing fellowship and that, that was just wonderful. So what we've got here is one actually from where I live near Worcestershire. Uh, this chap, John Badger says, it was completely different to anything I'd seen on television before, but years ahead of its time. It's not a fan club, is quick to point out, we appreciate the prisoner as a work of art. It could be shown again and again, it's ageless. Roger Goodman says, the prisoner offers a chance to examine our society and our attitudes towards it. Each episode posed a different moral or philosophical question. He goes on on quite a deep level. So um, the growth of prisonership began to go out to uh, all these different um, individuals. Um, perhaps what I'll do is I'll show you, our first proper mail out, Tally Ho. Tally Ho, <laughs> we wanted to be different no page numbers, blue paper, red ink, yellow ink, orange ink. It was um, really quite something. And it began to set out our philosophy. Welcome to Six of One, the Prisoner Appreciation Society. And uh, this was really what lit and fired people's imaginations because we were now on our way. Contributions from the three of us, a list of the local groups, all sorts, the yep, details of Patrick McGowan and everything. And um, in those days, you've got to remember, you know, people didn't have the internet. They didn't have 
videos. You couldn't record something on t TV. What we had was each other and meeting each, each other. I, I'm going to read out a few of the comments that people wrote. Now I know I'm among friends. I believe I can speak more freely my views on the prisoner. I believe there is a bit of number six in all of us. Each one of us is trying to be different from the accepted norm to escape, to rebel against the run of the mill humanity. Alan Atherton said that. Gary Davis says, I really dig the idea of us lot getting together. You could call it a family reunion. Richard Green said, um, at first I was tentative about getting involved as I'm the type who usually opts out of everything and withdraws into a shell. But for years I've been raving about the prisoner and not to involve myself would be hypocritical. So whatever six of one is, I want to be part of it. Then there were those who got the message. The Prisoner seems to be the only commercially made series which doesn't treat its audience as morons. On the other hand, it isn't an intellectually geared program that makes it unique. The Prisoner is more than just entertainment. It has no doubt profoundly affected your lives. Robert Cottrell, Marnie Allen. I've often heard it said of The Prisoner that it was before its time. I think not. It was a warning. Now, 10 years after, the images are less distorted. The village looms large in our daily lives and we can no longer afford to ignore the messages of the series. You know, people are taking this pretty seriously. People then talk about it being a 1984 update, you know, and all of that sort of thing. And here's one that I particularly like, you know, uh, it is fear that makes us all prisoners of ourselves, Peter Tyner Beda, and Peter Wilberg said, we each create our own personal reality, the discovery that we are responsible for what happens to us, that we are each number one. Today, only the most courageous risk such responsibility in thought, deed, or even imagination. The prisoner has such courage. He will enjoy eternal life opening ever more doors to the village of the self and its greater reality, that of the mind. Glennis McCairns, who was at the January the 23rd meeting all those years ago, said, uh, the prisoner, if only people would look into the storyline and see we're all number six, he hoped we would then question the way in which our lives were increasingly controlled. Membership was wildly enthusiastic. And in those days, building societies wondered what on earth to put in their windows. And so what happened was, we generated stuff and members self-generated, -gener and we had building society windows devoted to the prisoner. It was extraordinary. So things were going along really really well and because of the generation of what became alert our magazine magazine loose leaf sheets printed on <laughs> on different color paper um, every three months we held a work in and round about 60 70 or more people would drive from all over the country to put the alert together and send it out. Yeah, so we used to put all the alerts in the pillar boxes, but the post office got so fed up because we were filling all the pillar boxes that they actually <laughs> approached us and asked to have a box uh, number. And um, you will see that there's an example on the photograph that's being shown of Roger outside his door with all the uh, post. It's just worth saying how we contacted a number of people because Roger was working full time on this, of course. Um, we managed to get hold of Leo McKern because one of our members was uh, worked for the gas board and read Leo McKern's gas meter. Um, we got hold of Donald Sindon because his son decided to become a member. Then George Markstein rang up. So all of these things were going on. We'd approached Port Merion 
and there was a newly appointed publicity officer, um, Trish Williams, and she was very enthusiastic. So on the 17th of April, we had our very first one day convention. And you'll see from the photograph that you're being shown, it was extraordinary. What we had to show was a rifle and an old pro projector, a 16 mil print. And we greeted people and I stood on the glor Gloriette between three and 400 people turned up. One chap hired a minibus to bring members from his area. A 16 year old slept under a hedge as he hitchhiked to Port Merion. It, people were really dedicated. And when I announced that Arrival was gonna be on the big screen, well, that was it. Uh, there was a stampede and we had to show it three times. Um, the second photograph shows Roger, Judy and myself, along with uh, the member Ray Bins, stood outside the entrance to number six, of course. Uh, I'm going to show a photograph now. There's Roger Langley appeared on the scene, as a number of people did in 1977. Some people moved to Cheltenham to be at the hub of what was going on. They felt so committed. And that was, let me think, Karen Pierce, Marnie Allen, Max Horror, Jane Rawson, Roger Langley lived in Ipswich and he drove down every weekend. Talk about, for all of these people, unwavering total commitment in Roger and Karen's case, and Max, um, across many decades, of course, and Larry, Larry Hall. If I'm missing people, I am sorry. So we'll go with the picture, which is, uh, let's see. Bring back the s number six, Clamour the 500. Roger Langley, collected over 200, nearly 300 press cuttings and put them into this booklet called World Gallery. It's extraordinary and it's all taken very seriously. A half page in the Guardian newspaper multiplied by six. Again, it, it treats us very, very seriously indeed. We, the letters continued to arrive. It just went on and on, membership grew. Um, <clears throat> then we got freedom for the prisoner. There we are. McGowan's fans take on the TV companies. And um, yeah, yeah, we got London weekend as it was to show the prisoner. And they were, they were very supportive of us. So there's Judy and Roger and a clearer picture, I think, or photo follows. Uh, that was from the Western Daily Press, the Reading Evening Post. Yeah, that's right, it's a big one in the Reading e Evening Post. Who is number one? A whole page. I'll briefly outline 1978 because everything was moving very rapidly. We had our convention in April. And again, we've got a good spread from the Guardian newspaper. It says, as an example of unswerving single-mindedness, the convention of devotees of the television series The Prisoner held over the weekend must stand in a class by itself. More than a thousand people congr congregated on the village of Port Merion to sum up their commitment as totally dedicated might be an understatement. <laughs> And here's a photograph of the front door. I'd better tell you about this. This is in San Francisco. In June of 1978, I went over to uh, the States and I've been in correspondence with Anna Jovanovic, who lived in San Francisco and was a very, very keen prisoner member. And the, the, the series was actually playing on their local public service broadcasting. So. I went over and I stayed with Anna and her family and I went down to the TV studio 
and was part of a small panel that discussed the prisoner afterwards and then had a phone in. <laughs> so that's what I was up to in June of that year. And I came back home and Roger had been incredibly busy. But we've got this because by now, internationally, we've been picked up and they'd sent reporters to our convention from all over the place. This whole page here that I'm showing you, it says prisoner series ends, but the plot keeps getting thicker. And it was actually, they sent him over for several years, the report of Bob Merry for the Chicago Tribune. So we were truly getting international. Um, it was really quite something. And then we got any opportunity, cult series fans welcome new stamp because there was a stamp produced with a penny farthing. It was, <laughs> it did, did make, make me smile. Um, and the highlight of that year was when we had our first convention with a guest. And that was the Thatch Barn Convention that was held on the 1st of October at the Thatch Barn, where obviously the, the girl who was deaf was uh, part, partly filmed. And the guest was Ron Grainer. And if you look at the photograph being displayed, there is Ron. And uh, what a lovely chap he was. We showed some episodes and Ron was interviewed by Roger. And Roger reckons that it was burst, bursting at the seams, and we are talking several hundred members turned up. It was awesome. We're talking maybe five, six, seven hundred of our members arrived. Roger thinks it was more. And if you look at the second photo, then you'll see that that's the record of the theme music that was produced. Roger Goodman, Roger Langley, and a couple of others were doing all of uh, that. And that was a highlight. The other event that happened that year was we decided to have a motorcade. We had a London walkabout at all the various venues and a drive to Beachy Head. And on the way, we called it the fallout tunnel. And there's a picture of me standing just inside the fallout tunnel in my car. And in fact, it was one of the last opportunities that one would get to do that because it had been bought by the council. And in those days, this is what happened with railway lines that closed down and that had tunnels or deep cuttings. They were used by the council to fill in with landfill all waste. So that, that takes us through to the hallowed year of 1979. The momentum just carried on and again it was, it was press and it was, it was huge. And here we have the TV show that just won't die. This was from the Wolverhampton Express and Star and it says here but for McGowan, this was always very much more than just another role. The growing interference by outside government with basic human rights had and has become an obsession with him. Brainwashing, he says, is a particularly hideous form of torture. I can still remember my feelings of horror when I first saw grey-faced captive spies and pilots in Korea being paraded before the television cameras. Ever since... I wanted to yell back at those responsible. And I suppose you could say that the prisoner gave me the opportunity. Our convention that year was markedly different. In 1978, there'd been a chess game and all sorts of things. There'd been a two day event. In 1979, we made our own homage film to the prisoner. It had been a year in gestation. It was called by public demand. And I think really it's, it's worthy of putting on one side and dealing with separately. So we will come to that. 
about 50 members were involved in it and it was really showing people that we didn't just sit down and watch the series we actually did something so moving on from that i'm afraid that um i have to backtrack slightly because there's two sad events in 1978, just before, uh, two weeks before our convention, Judy died tragically young. She had, she was a very, you can see from the photograph you've seen, very intense looking, very serious, very driven. The prisoner meant a lot to her. So at the 79 convention, we put a plaque, which is still there and it's beside a tree that was planted in her honour. If you're on the piazza, you turn right, you go over uh, below the balcony there, um, at the edge of the lawn, you'll find a plaque to her, a queen at nightfall, and also, of course, to honour Sir Clough. Okay. Here at the convention, we were well covered because we got the Guardian and the um, Cambrian News, who again gave us fantastic coverage of what was going on and us fil filming. And in fact, when I cover by public demand, then you'll see that Harlech TV sent along a crew to film us as well. There was talk of us all getting together and buying a property and calling it Six of One Acres or Six of One Towers. And so a dedicated few, those who graduated to Cheltenham, would all live together and be a commune producing and running the society. That's, that's how we, we felt. We were so captured by it. Then another great opportunity occurred. I heard on the grapevine that an original mini moke had come up for sale. And this is my letter, handwritten, dated July, 5th of Jul July. I contacted the dealer who specialised in mokes, and he confirmed he had one of the original prisoner mini mokes. He had a buyer for it. But he said, this is Friday. If you can come up with the the money, a thousand pounds, by Monday, I'm getting another moke in, I'll put him off and you can have this one. You've got the weekend. So I spent the entire weekend on the telephone, ringing up members and with 25 pounds here, 50 quid there, the odd hundred here or there, we managed to get enough money that actually we were able to buy the moke. And if you look at the photograph, you'll see that the Moak eventually lived in Port Merion, and there's Roy Stambrow by it, and it lived there for many years until it moved, moved on. But it, it was a stalwart at conventions. <clears throat> now, the Sunday Examiner, believe it or not, of San Francisco later in the year, gave us a whole page, the plight of number six in an existential nightmare. <laughs> As you can see, people were taking the prisoner more seriously. And I'm going to kind of draw to a conclusion now, and just briefly say about 1980, students study freedom through the prisoner series that is in Ontario, in, that's the Niagara News, because in common with a couple of other places, there were now courses available, further education courses and allied to universities where people could actually study the prisoner. So what have we got from all of that? Well, you can see the intense enthusiasm. You can see how we were lifelong friendships were made. To this day, I think somewhere in the region of over 65,000 have 
pass through our portals, so to speak. I think it's wonderful that some of those who joined the society not only ended up with lifelong friendships, but actually got married as well. I'm a prisoner for life, as I expect some other people are, because I actually see the series as a, a route to freedom. But the best feeling in the world is to do something for somebody else and to think that I've been able to enable so many people to find, you know, satisfaction, joy, whatever, in the way that we've all come together, become friends, the fellowship and the marriages. Uh, but none of it, none of it would have been possible without those very important people back at the beginning, Roger and Judy, and then Roger and Karen, and others who have come along and carried the flag full, forward. So my undying gratitude to you all and forever be seeing you. Thank you very much for listening. And there's a postscript that I almost forgot. I don't know if any of you believe in coincidences or fate or whatever, but I trawled on the internet 601 and there's a bus service called the 601 bus service. Where do you think it runs out of? Boreham Wood. Boreham Wood. Yep. Now, either that is a coincidence or someone in the bus service who, who owns and run, runs it thought, ah. And the, adding to the irony of it, on the front of the bus, it says numero uno. I just thought that was quite remarkable. So next time you go to Boreham Wood, take the 601. Thank you.